Hi, uh, welcome all. Welcome to talk number 68. Um, we have with us today Shiva Vishwanathan. Shiva is fondly known in the design circles. Uh, Shiva is an NIDM, uh, passed out in the early 90s, in the uh, 1993 batch to be precise. And like uh, many of those who pass out in the early 90s, Shiva did start with uh, that time what was known as design, which is the especially from the graphic design and print industry. He did a lot of work in branding and he had worked with some of those uh, famous studios of that time. And uh, about Shiva and his profile and what he is today, he actually uh, is the CMO and a design head at catnet.io. It's an AI a company. I really do not know much about what happens with the company, but I'm sure in part of uh, discussion Shiva is also going to reveal about uh, what he currently does and we'll get to know about that. And uh, to know more about Shiva, there is enough um, uh, links that he has already shared and I put it in the forum. So to know more about it, so I don't want to uh, talk so much about his profile. Rather, I'm very much interested in, um, uh, in something that caught my attention in my discussion with Shiva. Uh, for someone who has actually evolved with times, starting with print and going into digital and now into AI, uh, it seems like someone who is just transcended. But underneath that tra change, I was very, very fascinated to discover that Shiva actually has uh, some kind of a framework. And this five hypothesis is part of that framework, which is a personal framework. Um, and through this framework, Shiva actually not only finds a way to engage with the ever-changing world, but also uses them very powerfully to change himself. And the kind of learning and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, shift that he is making to his own skills, his own practice, to be very relevant is something that caught my attention uh, when we were actually speaking about it. And I was so glad when he said that he would like to actually talk about it, and which not many people would be, uh, one, uh, able to articulate it so well like Shiva, and also feel so compelled and so uh, free to actually expose how their thought processes to actually bounce to the community is something that really appreciate. Um, he is talking about five hypotheses for the future. And uh, mind you, these are hypotheses that he has personally crafted from his own experience. And that's what he is going to talk about. And he is also going to uh, tell us the basis for how these things evolved. And uh, I'm sure that with this, we will actually be able to relate to what we do and also see how an approach like this can actually get the best out of each one of us. So there are many levels that uh, this is going to be very useful. One to know about Shiva, one to know about how a designer like Shiva thinks, and also take some lessons for our own uh, hypothesis if we want to frame. And I'm sure many of us would also use this opportunity to uh, engage with Shiva and then build a collaboration in whatever ways uh, we would like to engage with. So with that brief uh, background, I would like to hand over the session to Shiva. Shiva, it's all yours. Thank you. I, uh, Ravi, I do not know whether I can do justice to whatever that intro was. I mean, I didn't even know that I did all that. But yeah, so let me let me try and articulate as much. I'll try and keep it as painless as possible to everybody. That's one thing I can promise. So um, that's me. You guys can take a quick snap or like do the QR code. Takes me to the takes you guys to the link tree. If you actually take a look at the link tree, there is a bunch of links. You can take your time to go through that at your own leisure. Um, um, so one of the stuff that I was uh, wanting to do whenever I, by the way, this is a not a special presentation I had done. I have done for IDC talks. I have actually iterated this presentation over the last one year. Um, slowly, actually changed it and evolved it to a, a certain level. So, like Ravi said, it is an interesting format to share something. So, I've actually kept the format, moved the content around. That's broadly what I've tried to do uh, most of the time. So, one of the things that I surely did not want to do is I did not want to present a portfolio. And that's the worst thing that one can do after like you've crossed 50, 55 years of age. I'm 55 now, so 55 years of age. Incidentally, 68, which is the number of this 
presentation is the year that I was born. So um, this is called as the new narrative. Uh, it's five hypotheses for the future. This is something that's kind of formed over time, kind of changed and, you know, like plasticine. I've moved the stuff around a little bit and tried to formulate it to a certain extent. The nice thing about having a hypothesis is the fact that it may not be based by data. 30 years in the industry, and I don't need to actually have um, a data or any kind of an evidence that supports this stuff. So it's very personal, like Ravi said. It's got limited evidence, and the entire thing is when I share it, I keep telling them, you know, you can use it or not. So that it's kind of helped me. So I just hope it helps some people. So it's actually an interesting starting point for further investigation. That's why I keep calling these a hypothesis. Let's just jump to hypothesis number one. I seriously believe that as designers, we are sitting on ivory towers most often till we are really pushed. Uh, you've got to note that I'm actually doing this presentation to students, to young professionals, to people who have become you know, practitioners, to managers, uh, uh, and strategist and even senior management design leads. So I'm kind of, this is an arc. You will see an arc going through these five hypotheses. So let me start with the most basic one, which is learning to collaborate, right? So one of the stuff that we do is like, we sit in these ivory towers and think that we think the best and do not learn how to really collaborate. And it's important for us to understand that there are three prongs to every idea that we do. And these directives actually come from these three people working or these three teams working together. Business largely brings in the viability. I'm sure most of you know that, and I don't need to uh, preach to the choir, but business largely brings in the idea of viability and return of investment. How much, if I put this money, how much do I get? Or it also gives in the, brings in the, the domain expertise, right? They are the subject matter experts. Technology is focused more on feasibility and performance, ability to make an idea work, uh, work well, work harder, and keep working for a while without. So it's about feasibility, performance, reliability, and security. That's largely what technology is bothered about. Design is largely bothered about brand usability and becomes eventually the advocate of all users or all people centricity. Um, in every project and every possible uh, initiative that you uh, come across. So that is us. We've got to be proud about that. But unfortunately, we don't put people before ideas. When we actually get ideas, sometimes we tend to actually make the ideas more bigger than the people, which is not a great thing. So people are bigger than ideas. I think the design solutions are about their emotions, intent, and behavior in a very definite set context. And that's something that we should not forget that's actually number one right let me go to the number two right i know a lot of people who um assume they are the people that you're talking about designers and they are the target audience they are the people who are going to be users or you know whatever you may call them but the idea is to actually get out of the cubes that we sit in and feel Nice. So the earlier thing was also getting out of the cube, but getting out of the cube in a different way to collaborate. This is getting out of the tube, cube to know what the larger uh, idea, what who you are designing it for, and what the larger idea and the context is all about. I don't want to talk about design thinking process. I believe design thinking as a concept was derived by non-designers to talk about design. So it's like I keep saying that, um, that uh, if you go to, you know, in Goa, uh, Goan fishery is just called fishery. So when designers talk, we should be talking about thinking. We shouldn't talk about design thinking. Design thinking is a package that has been done um, for non-designers to easily walk into the stuff and talk wildly or even propagate, propagate the idea of design. I'm not complaining, but this is not what we should talk. But the interesting thing is that it starts with the concept of empathy. The empathy is to ability to understand and share the feelings of another, which is a great way to kind of look at the second part that once, once you get out of that cube that you sit in and look at a silo, uh, it's possible for you to actually walk out of that. It's, it's, you know, it's important for you to walk out of that. That's because the people that you design for uh, have an intent. They are emotive. 
what you do is going to change their behavior and hopefully their attitude about things. And that's when they become users. That's when they become target audience. And it's important for us to know that very well. So you got to observe, immerse, participate before you get creative about whatever you're doing, right? This is the second rung. We have actually gotten one step higher in terms of saying that get out of your cube. Um, so one of the stuff that I follow very heavily, I'm sure a lot of you do, this is actually a gentleman called Dave uh, Gray, who, uh, who was a part of Explain at one point of time, created this beautiful thing called Empathy Map Canvas, very useful for any exercise that you do. Unfortunately, people use it for UX alone, but it's not necessary. You can use it for every possible place which involves people. And I'm guessing that that's a pretty much every product, every project that we do. So this is available. Um, you can download it. It's called as the Empathy Map Canvas. And this is something that is close to my heart, and I use it very well. But I generally come across where people say that, what if I don't have to, I mean, or rather, what if I cannot meet the people? What if it's like a huge bunch that's spread all over the world? I want to quickly illustrate one old project that we worked on, which I was in Ogilvy, and I was heading the user experience design team. In, in Ogilvy and the digital team. So at that point of time, we actually had a fantastic um, data analytics team. So we actually used their ability to you know, uh, place um, listening posts and actually drag a whole bunch of content and see what we can get from that content. So the Lenovo's brief was very simple. They had three products, PCs, tablets, and smart. Three categories of products, PCs, tablets, smartphones. They basically wanted to sell it to the digital millennials, the hot property at that point of time as an audience. So their passion points were music, gaming, and photography. So they basically said, OK, how do we actually put this in front? You've got to understand that content marketing was one of the biggest things that was happening. This is we are talking about 2016, 2015, or 2016. Um, content marketing was one of the biggest possible thing that was happening. So we actually placed a bunch of listening posts and created this um, this entire data cube of sort made of com conversations alone that happens. So we listened to about 6 million conversations, um, 31 top themes. Like, for example, in PCs, uh, a theme is basically a display is a theme, and topic is like a retina. So you understand the categorization of PC. Under PC, there is a theme. Theme is a display. Probably display is one of the themes that are there. Under topic, there is a retina. is one of the themes that are there. In music, we actually broke it into two parts based on the amount of conversation that was there. One of them was like about creating it. Another one was about consuming it. So we, we looked at every conversation, which was about hardware, software, or apps. We looked at every conversation, which are about platforms, videos, and events, and consumption. Right. So eventually, I don't want to bore you too much. Eventually, we brought all those things together and created something which is a content marketing platform, which is an online magazine for on music, because that's the passion point and how it connects to the passion point, and people wanted to know more about it. And so we did music because there were about 650,000 music conversations, 70,000 specifically on hardware and software for manipulating music. So we actually worked with a gentleman called Nick Ullman Song Cabinets and created, um, you know, created articles out of what he did. Same thing with Tristan Schoen, um, which is for 11% of hardware con conversations on MIDI. So we worked with him and created content of the, that sort, right? Like, so similarly around rock, new age rock, or about uh, consumption, which is South by Southwest. That's because 409 conversations. So we also took these sample sets and had uh, P2P conversations with these people so that we could kind of drive deep into what they really wanted in the content. So also, we created these articles, these video embedded. And of course, the related all roads led to buying, hopefully, considering a Lenovo at least. So we actually had the right places where the product was plugged appropriately. It's one such project where it is empathy, but empathy at a scale of sort that where you do not really understand in the wholeness of it. But you look at data, and with a little bit of data and with a little bit of act conversations, can convert into something worthwhile. That actually takes us to the next thing, which is called as a make a connected story. Uh, I think 
one of the stuff that troubled me a hell of a lot is that we it's it's not a seamless one singular larger framework that we think about when we think about each piece of work uh, even in my history so uh, the interesting thing is to understand a gentleman called uh, mp ranjan um may rest in peace he passed away a teacher of ours he used to talk about this t-shaped designer as a concept right like where you got to actually know how how much you got to be a generalist and how much we got to be a specialist so generalist kind of indicates the horizontal on top and the specialist kind of indicates the depth of the t so how deep you got to go and how wide you got to go is something that you got to decide and that's why it's important for you to connect multiple things to create what you have to create right so that's the idea of this make a connected story so first i want to start with the concept of a business as a brand right like we've got to actually understand brand every business that we work for every product that we do every piece of work we do is in some way or the other connected to the concept larger concept of a brand brand is unfortunately something that is an abstract but we are very good at we designers are very good at taking something abstract and converting it into something tangible so brand is largely about the six pillars ambition is what does the business want to do in a few years purpose i'm sure you guys have heard of the simon sinek's golden circle and what how and the why of the brand itself or or of the product or of the the business that's going on the values or decision making principles that's born out of the purpose the audience the interesting thing about the audience is it is not about the demographics or the audience alone it's about the people who matter and the humanization of the brand which essentially means it's about their intent and their behavior within a context rather than saying they are like semi urban use this kind of gadgets and this is the kind of age that you're looking at these are kind of languages no it's way more than that to kind of focus on what is their intent and what is their behavior based on that intent within the context that your brand is in and the other one is persona interesting uh piece carl gustav jung actually created these 12 possible archetypes of persona to categorize human beings like you and i but unfortunately i don't think it went very far however it's a great tool when you actually got to categorize brands i mean there is a lot of examples that you can actually talk about where like ibm is this is this categorization is about perception it's about how do you want to build the communication and perception rather than anything else like if you actually look at a sage ibm is considered as a sage right um like five star or uh, some parts of cadbury's and five star is looked at as a jester brand and there are like if you look at the harley davidson and stuff like that it's an outlaw brand and so so on and so forth so the personas of the brand kind of define how do you want to engage with the audience and how do you want to communicate the last one is positioning i don't want to talk too much about you guys know what i mean it's actually devising the competitive landscape minding the actual gap or defining the gap and what is so special and differentiating about your product your brand your business is something that you kind of define that's broadly what the brand strategy part of it the connection piece number 1 the second piece is extending it into an experience so if i actually largely look at three parts to the entire life cycle of any initiative which is a business that you do there is acquire users slash consumers engage with them and hopefully retain them for a longer period of time and that's broadly what is going to bring us to some kind of a success i would think so the acquire part is largely about the brand the brand the marketing the communication so that it goes to the right place i mean we can talk about a lot more um but it goes to the right place you know triggers the right kind of stuff so that people want to be a part of this and know this or learn it and so the moving them into consideration and hopefully conversion and once they convert you go into engage ability to discover more features and understand the choices that it actually gives you and like how the fulfillment happens as to me reaching my goal as a user as a user experience design that actually comes from the researching customer slash user research and how do you define the product and the service and define the overall customer experience it need not be just user experience alone the last one is retention right customer relationship and loyalty program design all that kind of fits in and these are the three possible areas that you want to actually fall into um 
while we actually focus a lot more in the center in engage as user experience design i should talk about myself at some point of time i was thrown into ogilvy because wpp acquired my company and i was a part of ogilvy for a while so i realized that there is way more than what you can actually think of and what you look at as a brand like a brand strategy is typically broken into digital and offline offline is further broken into electronic media traditional digital content ott television print is again broken into adverts information instruction promotion similarly digital side there is content commerce mobile social and adverts so if you got to think of a brand in its entirety or the full spectrum of it it is important to kind of think this way so when our acquisition really happened and i happened to actually go into the office people thought there is somebody who has come to kind of head digital or understands digital they used to ask me what is digital not that i had a clue of how to explain what digital was so i mean when we don't know anything we go to wikipedia and it gives you stuff like this which is just a dumb list of things which doesn't really make sense so it kind of you know it was driving me nuts so i had to kind of devise a framework to try and understand or try and explain to my team at least as to how to define digital and how to actually think of a strategy that will work very well in digital that's a connected story going back to the the title of this hypothesis that we are talking about so if you just look at the channels there are these are the channels for convenience sake let's look at five you can add more if you want to and if you're sure about it and that's the fantastic thing about an uh, a framework right it can extend as much as you want so here we have web web what i mean by web is web content actually it changes further down but it's web content there is e-commerce there is mobile social and advertising as we know it in the digital arena that's the x axis in y axis i actually wanted to understand the concept of assets right so there are long term core brand assets like a website for example you put it up at some point of time when the business goes up you don't take it down you might modify it keep it on keep extending it for a long time but it will be there for a very very long time to come then there are we'll come up, come to gateways then there are campaigns on top which are seasonal which actually goes out to pull people in it could be digital campaigns that you put out in social media put out as performance marketing pieces that are out there people click on it and they are brought to these things called gateways which is kind of an extended communication of the campaign itself and hopefully the gateways eventually lead you to the core brand assets if the user is willing to connect so just going back quickly i actually had this in the x axis i had these three things which is campaigns gateways and core brand assets in the y axis uh, i might be getting this wrong but broadly in two axes right but i kind of slapped one on top of the other and created something that is kind of easy for us to hopefully understand so in web content we talked about say brand content which is largely about corporate brand websites at the core brand asset level or a basic online store in e-commerce or basic responsive templates in in mobile or or uh, and in social media assets just basic assets like uh, just having a i mean it used to be called as fan page just having a handle uh and communicating through the handle for the brands themselves gateways on the other hand are probably micro sites shop and shop has got bundle store pages um you know in mobile you can actually go up to specific functional apps of sort in native and web and then there is social conversations which are ongoing community management on top there are campaigns which are about mobile ideas social engagement and ad mailers i mean digital advertisement uh mailers and also the search engine promotions and stuff like that that you do now just for ease sake we actually printed it out like this and stuck it in front of everybody who is kind of working on strategy and as a digital team so that we could create connected pieces where we actually a campaign when it has a call to action connects to an appropriate gateway and connects to an appropriate uh, core brand asset over time and it doesn't matter whether it's on this side of the line or that side of the line even offline things like activation shopper or print tv could connect smartly with the digital idea of it and bring people in and above all this was the data analytics and measurement that constantly measured how things were doing this is broadly what the stuff is you've got to understand that this framework is very extendable so even if i just take content alone 
and it's very possible that I actually open the content out and I can actually see it as uh, multiple things like long form, short form content, visual, audio, video, and advertising. Like this, I can pretty much open up any of those horizontal pieces. Social media can be opened up you know, into a six column grid, so on and so forth. I can add more, like we can actually add the AR and the VRs of the world and the AIs of the world right now, whether it's you know generative visual or generative verbal, whatever that you want to do. So th this framework has helped me kind of fathom the idea of what we're dealing with on a daily basis. And that's that's broadly what this piece is about. Number four, so all we did till now is kind of slightly tactical. It's kind of almost mathematical, kind of formulaic, um, and of course had a structure and a framework to it. but we designers are interesting in many ways, right? Like I said earlier, we are able to connect the abstraction very beautifully and to a, to something that will eventually become tan tangible. We are actually magical creatures. So we take the rational technicalities and surround it with the emotive art, literature, music, and all kinds of inspirations that we have around it. And, and that has helped me arrive at concepts that are way more interesting than uh, what was before artists like Paul Clay, writers like Elif Shafak, or you know structural people like Doyen, like Buckminster Fuller, have been great inspirations to understand these pieces, especially the poetry of what we are doing. And I don't think that we should actually leave that in any possible way. I remember that being besotted by Rus Russian constructivist um, uh, posters at one point of time, typography and stuff, and at some point of time later when I was uh, uh, a part owner of a restaurant and I had to design the brand and everything. And I was the only, I was my own client. So I can, I could actually use inspirations from that to actually create a brand language that broadly followed Russian constructivist method of looking at it. The connection being that we wanted to actually do a place for people to come after work and, and, you know, have a drink and food and stuff like that. So that's, broadly what that was and so we shouldn't forget that we are gifted to bridge this tactical to the conceptual or to the abstract to the tangible and it's important for us to recognize and be that bridge of sort to constantly do that it's not the math alone it's the poetry too that's got to kind of work together to create the math and poetry which is beautiful the last thing that i've come to is future is a friend i used to be very scared of a whole bunch of things that came up and bothered me as a future, right? Like, so I know that at one point of time, somebody told me the future is going to be more immersive. It's going to be deeper. It's going to be ex interactive, experiential, and way more personalized. And I think the future is already here. Um, so we see a lot of this happening to us as we actually speak, which is quite interesting, right? It's actually, there is a lot of conversational stuff that is happening, gestural, and we actually as people will become the interface of SART without any screens really in front of us in some way. Um, there is a short video that I have by Matsu Ishida. You can actually, the audio won't play, but you can actually see it. Uh, you can see it in, in uh, it's called hyperreality. You can actually see it, uh, search for it in YouTube and find it. But the larger thought of this is like a hyper-connected, hyper-real environment that is augmented very well. This is done as a, pretty much as a video to frighten people, and which I found very useful. So it's like somebody in Medellin in Colombia is actually working for somebody in Japan. And Japan, that person is the boss, and, and he's talking to that person. You can see the conversation that's happening in front of you but like this this entire stuff is about um you know an existential angst that the person who works for it has while she's actually traveling in a bus of sort and then she's got kind of points and stuff like that that that's like a social currency of sort right and she's bothered about those pieces and and interestingly it kind of moves on to the entire idea of how the road is filled with communication pieces and and so on and so forth. So I think it'll be great for you guys to take a look at it when you actually have time. I don't want to waste too much time on it. Uh, this is called hyper reality. You can search for it and you'll find it. Uh, uh, so from a 
from a future perspective, there are a whole bunch of interesting things that are happening, at least in the visual and uh, design front, right? There are AI-driven layouts to minimize wastage and minimize waste of time, effort, and money. Uh, there is live monitoring and correction of stuff that is happening both for print and for uh, web right now. There is workflow automations that are like changing itself as we go. There are smart die cut all algorithms that's coming up for print, especially. I don't know about the rest of the stuff. There is the collective creativity of AI and humans working together, which is called just the augmented intelligence right now, which we are doing some wonderful work, uh, which we wouldn't have really thought about. It's and and it, it in you know the, the entire thing has happened in the last few months, right? Uh, probably starting October, November onwards till now, the amount of moment that has happened, and uh, this entire eye tracking, data to design, and how how design is created using AI uh, based on eye tracking, and this bridge to social media, direct response, direct to consumer platforms. There's a whole bunch of things that are happening in this. But what I did was that I actually work with theater groups. Um, so I, in a small way, started using generative AI at one point of time with um, probably about uh, six months back in a very rudimentary fashion to create some basic posters and stuff like that for uh, this group called as Rangashankara and other theater groups that I work for. The first set of posters, of course, they were posters. They're not that they were achieving something big, but Still, it is more to actually exercise my ability to use them and understand them better. So the, the you can see that the evolution of the posters of sort. This is probably Mid Journey 3.0, either 2.0 or 3.0. I don't remember. So it kind of has a typical Mid Journey look, and and then eventually I. So this entire set is done in that Mid Journey 2.0 or 3.0 kind of a look. Then further on, it moves into you know like almost photorealistic quality at 4.0 and 5.0 which i'm working on which is one project that i'll visit and quickly show you what we are up to that project is something that has gone into completely photorealistic pretty much uh you know like right now people are doing photography and stuff like that as you know and art and photography using using generative ai that's the area that we have front anyway i'm not spending too much time these are like ex examples and explorations that we did for like a fake packaging which is broadly about how to uh, package integrity and honesty of sort and you know how it can be an instant relief from regrets that's the larger thought of this stuff just to see how it works in the entire design process but interestingly i'm working on a stealth project right now um i cannot talk too much about it i'm going to show some screenshots which is basically for a museum, we are actually creating an audiovisual of sort that involves recreating or rather um, generating true historical or rather inspired by history, but creating a whole bunch of incidents and stuff like that that happened in history through the eyes. So this is for a museum that's going to come up in like the next six to eight months. And this is the work that I've been kind of working on. And this is going to be converted into a audiovisual. And that's broadly the last piece of work that I've been doing. So to discuss all this future stuff, at some point of time in 2017, a couple of friends of mine, 2016, a couple of friends of mine and I started this stuff called as Design Up. Design Up is a conference. It's a community and also a course of sort where, again, you can't hear the audio, but I'll give you all this stuff. So this is 22 version. Uh, this is after the pandemic. We are all gathered together and put this stuff together. And this is largely about a whole bunch of designers working at the intersection of technology and design, getting together and exchanging ideas of sort, which is about probably everything from, you know, um, using uh, tools of sort for research to using tools and betterment, uh, you know, elements of sort that we use in design. Uh, about 650 attendees were there. And then, you know, everybody from a junior service manager to a lead designer were a part of this stuff we do it every year the 31 odd speakers for that 23 one um uh, there were all kinds of people including um writers authors um of course speakers and um then there are like six conference sessions which is largely about conversations that are open conversations about various things from ethics to and idea sharing of sort and that's uh, that's the kind of 
stuff that we do at Design Up because I we think that there is no forum that discusses specifically the kind of angst that people have today um, on this intersection of design and technology, especially with a whole bunch of people being thrown out recently. And, uh, you know, we've got to find our foothold and stuff like that. So that's that's what we do. And uh, before I go, I please do see designup.io. You will see the stuff that comes up there. So I want to leave you again with these five things that I talked about. One is learn to collaborate, ability to work with business and technology teams and put your people before your ideas, which is the people are bigger and greater than your idea. Second is get out of the cube, unless we are going to observe a person, participate in stories uh, that happen outside. You can't build a connect of sort. The third is make a connected story. Create a framework of sort that helps you actually connect the entire idea of acquisition, engagement, and retention uh, of people uh, that are connected to your product, your brand, your business. Uh, the fourth one is be the bridge, because we are good at connecting the abstract to the tangible. So use the poetry and bridge the bridge it to the uh, tactical, so conceptual and tactical bridge both of them. The fifth one is future is a friend. It might be frightening, but there are lots of things that it can do that is quite astounding and amazing for oneself. There are two, um, there are two products that we are working on. When you get time, you can take a look at it. Um, one is a decision aid tool for school students to choose what they want to do. The second is actually a, a soft skill and uh, soft skill and uh, aptitude evaluation platform for corporates for their employees. So these two are the products that I'm working on right now, and that's all I have. And the QR code that that is on the screen, if you guys want to connect, you can actually use that and connect. Thank you. That's. That's about it. Um, we can open it for questions if you guys have any, and take it forward. Sure, great. Uh, thank you, Shiva. Uh, uh, I, I would like to open this forum for uh, questions. Uh, those who have, please uh, uh, click this uh, raise the hand button so that I will know and I can. Uh, there are some claps and claps and. This thing is coming up for you, Shiva. So nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Rukwed, go ahead. Rukwed, you had a question? You're on mute if you. Rukwed is on mute, so unless he's. Uh... Oh, okay. You can post the stuff on a chat too, Rukwet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you yeah, can't, yeah. like, yeah, Rukwet, you can just... If you're not able to reach us, you could post it on a... On the chat, then we should be able to see it and pull it up. Uh, so I have a question, uh, Oro, here. Oh, all right, uh, Oro. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. So do you think generative AI is a threat to uh, us, or how do, you th how, how do you look at generative AI for designers? Oh, I, I actually, saw your presentation amazing. I mean, you are doing great stuff. Even with generative AI, uh, your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I've been hearing a lot of these things about generative AI <laughs> being a threat. I really do not think so. I mean, that's why I, I call AI augmented intelligence and not necessarily artificial intelligence alone. Uh, mm -hmm. Like somebody said that. Uh, the opposite of artificial intelligence is natural stupidity, right? Like so, actually, it's a it's a great thing that kind of works. Uh, but I I think artificial or rather generative AI specifically is a great tool if we can actually include it as a part of your design process, and that's going to be the next thing, right? There is an interesting uh, podcast that I heard recently in HBR, which is uh, asking the same question. Right. Mm -hmm. But the most interesting thing that it does is that it's one stuff it stresses on, especially with me, it's stressed on is that it has made me open out the process more to people that I sell my end products to. Like, like right now, I don't just sell my end product because people always question, uh, or uh, is ChatGPT done it, or, or has Midjourney done it, or is it like 100 other tools? Luca as a tool has done it. 
But right now, what I do is I make sure that I show open out my process and show my process, which essentially means there is a clear place for AI as a tool. There is a clear place for human beings to kind of bridge that gap, emotive gap that happens between AI and the uh, end product of design. So I don't see it as a threat at all, but I think it is going to be amazingly brilliant. Our work is going to change quite a bit. The kind of work that we do is going to change a lot, but I don't think it's a threat at all. And uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Shiva. Uh, excellent presentation. And uh, what I really liked is um, uh, how you put generative AI as a tool, as a companion rather than a threat. Um, so. For example, we do a lot of research, right? We do a lot of research. We speak to a lot of the users and customers and tons of data is uh, collected. And I'm sure generative AI can help us in, instead of we spending sleepless nights with uh, post-it notes across our office, trying to analyze and trying to group them and trying to figure out what what is part of the insights that actually we could no, derive so, uh, from it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is a possibility. But one thing that I am, the only thing that I'm worried in a big way is the is the bias that intrinsically happens because of the data that is kind of in generative ai there are lots of situations where that bias is kind of is uh, like i don't think you can fully rely on that uh, data as uh, the you know with generative ai uses so i think it needs um, it is a good companion but it is not the source it will never be the source I'll be surprised if it will ever be the source by itself. And it will always Me have too. its problems. It always has yes. its problems because I, I was actually telling this to a bunch of people, right? Unfortunately, a generative AI is uh, run by a bunch of billionaires who are not nice people. Uh, <laughs> you know, the technology, unfortunately, is owned by all technology is owned by a bunch yeah. of billionaires where the bias is evident. I'm I'm just joking by saying not nice people, but the bias is evident. So that's the only thing that we've got to worry about. I don't think I'll use it as a source ever. Yeah, maybe as an insight generator is fine, but not as a source of knowledge. Um, that will be really dangerous and uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I saw a question. Thanks, thanks, Atana Rabindu. I saw a question pop up on the uh, Yes. Stuff. I, can you read that out? Sorry, Ravi. Yeah, uh, it's from Rigved. Uh, he's asking, design is a wide and deep idea. And day by day with evolving ecosystem around design, it is creating super niche specialities. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how do you bring all people together in the interest of everything design? Oh, yeah. So so that's an interesting point of view, right? Like, so there's, there has always been the question of specialism, specialist versus generalist kind of a thing. I grew up in a generalist world where, I mean, I find it very bizarre that there is a completely different team that is looking at, or rather, there is one person who is looking at one user segment to actually understand that segment very well and take get insights from. I find it I find it extremely difficult. I think there is a lot of loss in translation. Uh, you call me old, but that's the truth, according to me at least. But then um, it's the time of generalists again, especially with the advent of AI and tools of that sort, which are actually uh, driving, you know, rather that, that, that can cover ground. It is important that you actually have orchestrators, conductors of sort, who can actually uh, it's like what Steve Jobs said that you play the clarinet, you play the uh, basically you play the clarinet, you play the cymbals, you play the drums. What do you do? So Steve Jobs says that I play the orchestra. So I think that's the entire deal, right? Like the generalists uh, have got to kind of look at it from the larger sense of the things, and especially with this concept of ability to look at abstract and emotive content that is there, and ability to look look at the logical, rational, and the uh, tactical part of it and ability to bridge that we've got to be great generalists to do that at all um but uh yeah i mean i saw your question fleetingly rugvid um uh, uh yeah the question is that i am not really sure whether that's so what is happening to engineering at one point of time or what is happening to other vocations at one point of time happen to design? That's why you actually get silos of sort, very granulated silos of sort that are sitting inside 
one sitting inside the other, right? Like the uh, Matrushka dolls kind of a method of looking at it. But I, I think it is a larger change that we need to look at from a corporate perspective. And that's evident more in large enterprises looking at people, like we throw people at problems, right? So you actually have X number of things that needs to be done, get another person to do it. And that's, I think, how the silos really happen. Uh, and I think there will be more and more reason for generalists to work across the board of sort. And hopefully we'll see a time when you know things are orchestrated by more generalization and more people who are able to kind of fathom the entire lot of silos and see a hole in it. Right. I don't know whether I answered the question, but it's a pet peeve. So I wrote a recent blog post on that. Please do go and see it at medium.com. The link is there on the uh, in this um, in the QR code. Still, uh, till uh, someone comes up with a question, I have. Uh, okay, Rigved is saying thank you. Okay, thanks, Rigved. Pleasure. See, um, um, I think the question that Aro is asking is is probably the question that uh, every domain, not just design, is asking. So. Um, Still, we really don't know yet as to as to what it means, what kind of jobs will go away, what jobs will come. But there is one that uh, I'm gathering, Shiva, with your uh, the other discussion we had the other day, is that there is a possibility that uh, a lot of these angst can be put to rest if we deeply engage and take the lead, um, rather than wait for uh, you know uh, the world telling us as to what is going to happen, what is your role and how you should deal with it. Supposing you actually get yourself immersed and then kind of uh, take the lead and then define, given a tool like this, when it has come to me and is I need to lap it up, what do I do? What kind of changes and shifts that I will make for myself? You know, I think no, that, that's true. That's a very personal way of looking at it. But the way I see it is that that change is got, like, for example, I don't see a life cycle that a designer goes through is any different from a product life cycle, right? Technically, there is a design education part that we all went through at some point of time. Unless we repair that, the, the further down things are not going to repair. Design education is getting siloed. It's getting extremely um, you know, thin, filed into smaller, smaller pieces because there is a need for universities and colleges to create multiple methods of earning so they are siloing everything out and not like looking at a unifying whole at, at any point of time. And that eventually is feeding into the industry. And that defines the perception of the industry because I think still the hires of recruiters for designers are not necessarily designers alone. So the understanding of the recruiters have not changed and so on and so forth. So it's like we've got to correct the life cycle. So, but what you say is true. If we want to correct ourselves, it's the easiest. But if you've got to create the system, you've got to see at the source. Yeah. Sorry, I saw another question come up, Barka, I think. Barka, go ahead. You are on mute, Barka. Yeah, yeah. Go sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I had a question about when you say design education and the future of it. So how, like, I, I myself am in, uh, in academics right now. And okay. being a designer, it, it sometimes is a little difficult for me to make the students understand that how important it is to understand the basics and not jump to AI tools and all these things. Because I think it's necessary for them to go through the grill first, you know. The <laughs> Absolutely, you're right in saying yeah. that. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. True. But but so I didn't do mean change that. I, I didn't mean it that way. I think there are like there, the way I see it is this, right? There are elements, which is the fundamentals. And fundamentals, I don't think any tool can, like even the old tools or the new tools or a fancy newest possible tools can't change the fundamentals in any way. So I think our building blocks are fundamentals of sort. I don't know how to convince the students, but you've got to actually tell them the fundamentals are there. You don't, you won't even know how to use any basic tools or rather, you will use the basic tools and it won't be a respectable method of using the basic tools you know so so that kind of fundamentals going in is kind of extremely important so i actually build the stuff as um, the reverse of system thinking is what i mean i 
why I'm talking about this is because recently I did a uh, designed a couple of courses for a college in uh, Delhi, and so uh, the stuff was I was very clear that whatever we teach, especially in graphic design or in user experience design, it was important for me to look at it as the fundamentals, which is the elements and how the elements get together to create those components. I mean, it kind of vaguely seems like uh, atomic design, but truthfully, it is that, right? That's the new way of teaching stuff. So how the things get together and build components and how the components have got to kind of get to build together as patterns and the patterns kind of are built together to create uh, templates and the templates are built together to create a brand or a business. And if we actually are very, very clear about this path of uh, going to the stuff, it's 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 quite nice to indicate that these tools fall only here. So there is no point kind of jumping to that because you haven't built the stuff of the elements and the components and the patterns and the templates that you were before you jump into the pages and before you jump into assets and before you jump into the brand because pages and assets come way down the road. So I, I think one of the problems that I think I think design education does not do today is that it doesn't roadmap the learning very well. It actually says that go out. It's like the one of the stuff that I've heard is that you explore and find out, right? But I think there has got to be a general roadmap that is drawn out saying that this is your starting point, this is your midpoint, and this is your end goal. So these are the 10 things that you've got to learn over time. And these are the probable tools that you can use as you go. And I think that's that visibility is not there. Yet, or at least it's not said that way. Yeah, I agree. So that answers the question. Thank you. Pleasure. Go ahead, Ankur. Thanks. I've, first on, as in, I had written a message long back when uh, Shiva, you had started speaking about the Novo strategy around, I think, 2017 18, they were one of my clients, and the Novo Global was following this different makes better, different sings that's better, dances that's better. That's yeah. Right, yeah. I, I thought you were going to talk about that because I really love that uh, that whole positioning. But yeah. uh, on, on, another, on another note, I've been thinking that uh, so more and more the way what we produce is being driven by our language and how we instruct. So in the future, do you see certain linkage with design and language or you know, oh, the semiotics? Oh, totally. Ankur, like you actually, that's a, again, another fabulously pet topic. So let's not look at anything else, right? There's this entire mm. concept of prompt engineering, which everybody is talking about these days, right? Ability prompt engineering? To, yeah, which is mm -hmm. actually devising the best possible method in which you can do prompts for AI to generate what you really want. Mm. Because right? it's so, currently it's just a black box. When you give an instruction, you don't have a control or a no, no, you a have a, You have a serious amount of control. Ankur, it's formulating mm. and it's actually have deadly control. And it's I'm, I'm not saying that you can, can control everything, but there mm. is a lot of controls that are formulating. And interestingly, it's, it, that, that what you're talking about, there is a new semantics that are actually being formulated mm -hmm. to actually ask the questions in a certain way and and actually come up with the um you know come up with the right kind of thing or the kind of stuff that you want to see so that's one instance of where language is important but in, if i actually go right back to where i started the most influential course that i did in my uh, graphic design course in NIT is mm -hmm. this it's a short course that was done by this gentleman called Max Halston, um, who actually taught us about uh, rhetorics, a figure of speech, mm -hmm. right? But he basically said how figure of speech is a departure point for conceptualization. Um, uh, while it was a interesting gimmicky first idea thingy, but I love the concept of actually using language constructs of sort to actually look at look at what we create mm -hmm. right like this is a pre-existing like i'm sure i'm sure cinema had a situation where it actually evolved from ability to write the scene out and then it actually moved on to actually looking at long shots close-ups and jump cuts and it formulated a completely new um, emotion in the narrative yeah yeah i'm saying forget the narrative the language on its own right like mm -hmm. that is on so i'm i am 100 percent sure that there is a more and more correlation is happening between how do you actually write and articulate and 
and i have been a big fan of reading literature i mean whether it's elif shafak or gabriel garcia marquez or italy calvin or because i think um, i believe that structure is the most underserved piece than form uh, yeah. we always get besotted by the form that you actually see right but there is beneath that lies a structure which you don't see but that's what is making the form beautiful in one sense like when you feel look at the space structure and form piece and most often i kind of try and quote this haiku structure mm-hmm. of the haiku is what makes it beautiful right and and the form eventually is wrapped over it the meaning that comes out of it and the single word that hangs out as a syllable and those kind of things so it's i don't know whether it's a i'm going to give any conclusive point but i'm <laughs> I'm it's it's fantastic that you bring up this correlation between uh creativity and language as a concept and so everything that we do uh because that's the only we, only way we know how to express uh yeah, because uh, in in IDC like in uh, in uh, Atwankar sir used to take this course on semantics which was oh, actually yeah. yeah. bringing in you know yeah. typicality to a typicality and being able to give a gradation in between yeah. and then uh, come up with something like okay design a new headset for indian women for the sporty kinds yeah. like now these are prompts but back then it used to be things that we would sort of break apart use the word try and find meanings of the word try and find products which depict that word yeah. and try and find elements of it and so we were basically deconstructing it yeah. but i'm saying that now that it's become a standard like that's the status quo now where does language go from here like people start talking to each other in a more instructive way or do you see that in <laughs> i don't know, i can't predict that like... much. <laughs> but it's an interesting thought that probably a great premise for a, a blog <laughs> movie <laughs> yeah but thanks thanks pleasure yeah. but, but then you also said that you will not be talking about portfolio but in the end some way you did sorry so... <laughs> i i had to kind of illustrate my uh, you did you did know that i did stuff with the ai but i yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. I mean thanks. what I I mean surely not my 30 years portfolio it's probably the last 6 months <laughs> so um, yeah. and in your design up conference i think the first humans on on the picture like arjun beta from beta oh, 5 yeah. it's been close yeah, and, yeah it's been yeah. doing great work so i've heard a lot about design up and i've got to participate in it please but, do uh, come if you are around bangalore and this yes. year we are planning uh, multiple things all over india so hopefully we'll have some plan very quickly actually this weekend mm-hmm. yeah so great thanks thank you, thank you. Thank you thanks so yeah. thanks anko um we are just hitting 4 minutes past 10 i i know shiva uh, we are also <laughs> stuck to your uh, uh, you by 30 minutes to your bedtime and uh, uh, let me let me uh, thank you shiva for this for this excellent Pleasure. session um uh, i'm sure like the last word that you expressed about the importance of structure over the form i'm sure you have grasped the form and probably linger over the structure behind this five hypothesis very deeply um very well articulated very nicely uh, string together with your uh, e- examples and um, i'm sure that this will this will stay with us for long and uh, and uh, most of us many of us who have have been inspired by this will definitely would want to connect back with you and i'm sure you will you will be available for any sort of co- collaboration or or exchange and yes, uh, and we we wish all the success for the current the exploration on ai i'm sure we will soon have you back <laughs> talk about the 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 uh, foray into the ai and uh, where you have some very very deep uh interest and we would like to hear a lot about what's happening in the domain and uh, on behalf of the uh, idc forum i alumni forum i thank you a lot and then uh, wish you wish you all the best and then hope to see you soon and the recording of this will be available uh, as early as tomorrow and uh, and uh, we also have some next set of speakers lined up and with that i would like to say good night and goodbye and have a great week ahead thank you thank you all thank you all for listening to me yeah. thank you shiva thank yeah. you ravi i am stopping the, stopping the recording right now and uh, sure. if somebody wants to stretch a bit few minutes stay back and do a